Hello and welcome to Armour's Angle. This is a brand new channel and it's a channel that's going to bring you lots of tips, lots of reviews on tackle, venues. I'm going to seek out different venues, different approaches and run through everything from bait preparation right the way through to tackle choices. Different times of the year, different venue types, including what we're going to do today, which is our very first one, as we've said, and it's on a Bedfordshire Reservoir, which is very low after the summer, but hopefully I can show you some tips on how to catch some of the reservoir's resident bream. So where do we start? I've got to the top of the bank, found the reservoir very low. Great reservoir, 10 to 12 foot down. Knowing the reservoir like I do, it's kind of an irrigation reservoir. It's more like a bowl. You've got two short sides, two long sides. I've chosen a spot, put my box down today and set up middle of the long side bank. Now the reason I've done that, you can look at the contours of the outline of the reservoir. You can see they slope gradually from all the sides towards the middle. It's kind of dug like a sink almost. So what I've done is I've made it easy for myself by A, sitting in the middle of the reservoir, not quite downwind, more slightly wind in my face. But what I'm thinking is, and, I've, and it's kind of being confirmed, is when I cast a bomb out, I can get to the deeper water 30 to 35 metres. I've chosen a line at 35 metres into about 12 to 15 foot of water and I can always let the, give the fishing room to back off to. So that's the reason for swim selection today. Always look at the contours of the bank. There's a giveaway when the venues are low. Look at the clarity of the water to see whether your fish would be more confident sitting out in the lake in the deeper water, or whether you could potentially catch them shorter. But the depth out there is a depth I'm happy with for the larger fish that I'm targeting today. We're in winter, we don't need a lot of bait. We're not fishing a match, we're pleasure fishing. We've got the reservoir mostly to ourselves. I'm looking at targeting the larger fish in the lake like we discussed earlier. Fish meal ground bait, one of my first choices for these kind of waters. I've darkened it up for winter. It's pre-dampened, so I dampened this first thing in the morning before I even left the house. It was about an hour's drive to here, so it gave me a good hour to get this ground bait right. And as you can see, it's the good thing about using fish meal ground bait, it does absorb an awful lot of water. So if I want to squeeze that a little bit tighter, toe gets up. I want to kind of pack the feeder a little bit tighter, more loose offerings, I can do that. But as you can see, this will just break down to powder. So it empties out the feeder and will empty quick if I need it to. I probably don't need it to empty out quick today because it's deep water, it is winter, the fish are less active. But like I said, it's great because the colour's, the colour's right. I like the fact there's crushed pellets in it. It's dark, texture's dead, dead right for this kind of fishing. Moving on to the hook baits for today. I've got dead maggots. As I said, I'm looking for big fish today. I'm not looking for small fish. We're not looking to be bringing back 20, 30 fish. We're looking at maybe five, six bites, and that could be 40 pounds. Deb maggots are definitely my choice. Sweet corn. Sweet corn is one of those baits, especially for big fish, even in the winter. It's visual. You always know if there's small fish in the peg, it will still remain in the peg, just for when those big fish move in. I'm not going to use a lot of it. I'm going to put two, three, four grains each time I'm casting out. Just keep building up the peg with a few grains of corn. I always know there's something there left, even if the maggots have been eaten by small perch or some nuisance fish. So sweet corn is definitely one of those baits I'll always bring with me for, especially for large bream. Casters, I'll never go anywhere without casters for bream. So I've got with me only a pint of casters today because like I said, you don't need a volume of bait with pint of dead maggots, sweet corn, casters. But again, casters, an inert bait, a lot of water in them so you know that they're not going to fill up the fish just by putting a few in through the feeder during the session so casters again are a good choice and you can nip a maggot and a caster again it's another change bait live maggots not a bait i'd always bring for feeder fishing for big bream but it's always handy to nick a live maggot on in the winter when bites are hard to come by and like i said we're only fishing for a few bites today so a live maggot i can always nip a dead and alive couple of dead maggots and a live maggot a couple of live maggots worm and a live maggot always handy to have with me. So now we've discussed what baits we're going to use for today. I'm going to start the session by getting baited up and get fishing. So I'm going to put a pinch of red, dead red maggot, pinch of casters. Like I said, a couple of grains of corn. Don't have to squeeze the ground bait too tight. A small grit mesh feeder. Just clean the feeder off and let's get going. So where do we start? Feeder fishing shouldn't be just seen as a, a chuck it and chant it method. It isn't just a case of casting into the lake in the hope that a fish pulls that feed, hooks that, picks up that bait, pulls that tip around and I'm in. There is a lot more to it than that. 
we said earlier, I'm only looking maybe potentially for five or six bites. So it's important that that feeder is exactly where I've put those bait up at 35 meters. So it's important to have a marker, far bank marker. I've got a little bush on the far side here. You don't want something that moves, you want something that's gonna stay there. So I'm gonna to cast to it regularly throughout the day. Now what happens like today, the wind has changed. So one minute the wind's coming in my face, the next minute the wind's coming from right to left. I still need to be able to hit the same place, hit the clip every time. And a lot of that is deterred by the tackle you use. So today I'm using braided hook, bra braided main lines, got a shock leader, which is great because that keeps the line down, less liners on the bottom. But I've got something that's very fine that can cast accurately. And what I like about using braid, when it's windy particularly, is it's very fine. So it cuts through the air nicely, runs through the rings ni nicely, but more importantly, it doesn't get towed 10 meters down the lake. I can just hit the clip in a straight line, which is important. So I never feel it's undergunned. And that way I can keep everything straight. So there's no point hitting the clip high, but the feeder's actually only gone 25 meters and I've got 10 meters of line towing around the lake. It's important that everything is straight. Straight casting, everything runs out smoothly. The feeder's the right weight, which we'll discuss tackle in a minute. And uh, you know you're fishing exactly where you need to be fishing with confidence that you're in and around your feed area. So when you're topping up, you're putting it in the same area. You're not putting bait all over the reservoir, for instance. Right, I've now been fishing for about 20 minutes. So there isn't, I've had a couple of liners, but nothing's really come onto that bed of feed that I've put out there. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna reel in and do sort of five minute regular casts. Just to keep that noise, you know, the plop of the feed or the food going down, keep that bait falling through the water, you know, my hook bait in the hope that I can maybe draw a few fish into the area. Not much food, I'm not gonna put a lot of food in the feeder. What I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna put mainly ground bait, but keep it going in fairly regularly. So the idea is, like I say, is just to try and attract some fish into the area and then they'll home in on that feed. That's the, that's the plan. So let's have a, a session now where we have, say, three, four, five minute regular casts and then we'll take it from there and see if that works. Now what I've done is, I've, that braid has gone straight and I'll, that, I'm gonna bring that rod tip down with that braid straight. And as you can see, my rod rest is straight out in front of me. Gone are the days of having a rod rest sitting at an angle of having a rod rest here, because the beauty of that is you don't wanna be dislodging the feeder. Once that feeder hits where the food's gone, on the bottom where those bait ups have gone in, that's now sank. I want to be right on top of that and I don't want to be hitting the clip here and bringing the rod back here. I want to be hitting the clip there and dropping the rod there and everything is fishing straight away, literally within 20, 30 seconds, just a case of tightening that braid up because it is quite deep so it's going to take a while to sink as mono would and then now we're ready to fish. Always get a line by early doors when you chuck out, it's either the braids going through them because they're off the bottom, which is my, what I think's happening. Bite detection's important. It, I'm always using rod rest. So unless I'm fishing fast for small fish, I'm always putting the rod on the rest, keep my hands here by my, by my, on my lap, just make sure everything's tight so I can read the tip right. And then obviously you're not reluctant to strike on any little movement. You know, I'll only strike when I know that fish is on and that tip's going. Any fast pulls, jabbing at the tip, I won't, I won't lift the rod up. And that's the good thing about keeping the rod slightly away from me as well. Most of the big fish, you'll tend to get a really positive bite. The smaller fish will tend to just get, you know, small sort of taps on the tip. Bear in mind the distance we're fishing today is 35 meters. It's a nice comfortable chuck with an 11 foot rod. It's a medium action rod, it's a Daiwa tournament. I've set up a duplicate rod. Great rods for the job, a rod I, I certainly won't part with. Um, top of the range Daiwa rod tournament, so it's, you know, synonymous with the name tournament Daiwa. Bringing out a new range soon. Um, there are other rods which are just as suitable for the job, but that, uh, Guru do an N-gauge rod, which is fantastic. Similar lengths, 10, 11s, 12s, and heavy versions for rivers and so on. And also the likes of Preston also do a, a Supera, which is a good rod. I've had a look at that. I think it's 11 foot six, that one, which is great. And 
versatile for this type of fishing. And also Daiwa do a cheaper sort of entry level rod, which is called the Daiwa Enzon. And I've actually had a look at those and actually had a fish with those and they're also very good. But perfect rods for the job, casting weights up to about 30 grams with ground bait comfortably. Uh, you don't need to go any heavier than that, any heavier than that, just opt for a heavier rod, heavier action or longer rod, and you'll get much more uh, casting distance with those kind of length rods and those weight feeders with ground bait. But yeah, great rods for the job, nice progressive action. I'd class them as a medium action rod and perfect for those distances. Real choice for the, to kind of coupled with the rod, I go for a 3000. Again, it's a Daiwa. It's a TDR, ever trusty TDR, uh, the latest model TDR. It's, I don't go bigger than a 3000 because it's an 11 foot rod. I'm not casting long distances. Again, as like I said, it's up to 40 meters. So a 3000 reel on an 11 foot rod is perfect. Spool size, houses the braid perfectly, comes off well, mono the same. Balance to the rod, like I said, it's perfect. Good winding power. Uh, and like I said, never lets me down. Great quick drag on it. Metal line clips, which is important. No fail bail on. You know, like I said, it's a, a real workhorse. And that's on all my, all my rods for today. I've got three of them set up. But yeah, great reel. And there we go, last abream. What was interesting, how delicate the bite was. It was really slow. But you can see what I mean about the nice progressive action on the rod, it's a lovely smooth action. One of the, th one of the things about these reservoirs with this slope, you can see the slope, you've got to keep the rod high. You can't always keep the rod low, especially when you get closer in. There's a lot of weed left over from the summer close in. Just gently let the rod do the work. It's almost like a pumping action. It's like draw it backwards and then just reel down on it. And then just bring it over that near ledge. Because what we don't want to do is uh, get cut off on any rocks close in. Nice thing about fishing a shock leader as well is that you can you know when the fish is within netting range because the knot you can hear the knot through the top ring and then coming through the ring. Now I know that fish is within netting range. That's a lovely looking bream. And then just gently draw it over the over the weight and landing net. There we go. Lovely. Look at that. Well worth the weight. I'd say that's probably six pound. There you go, look at that. Beautiful fish. Let's get him into the keep net. We've had a visit. So hopefully now we can follow that up with another one. Like I said at the beginning, it doesn't always, this kind of fishing doesn't always mean you're gonna catch 10, 15 bream like that. You catch three, four fish of that size, it's the equivalent of catching 10, 11, 12 fish of a, of a smaller stamp. So, uh, like I said, it's, all, it's important, at least I'm confident we're fishing accurately and in the right place. It's just a case of being patient. We've tried the five minute casting, it resulted in a few perch, no bream, but I think what it did do is it got a little bit more food out there, which was good and I managed to get a few more loose offerings through the feeder, which basically filled those perch up and saw the back of them. And then shortly after then the tip goes round and we've got a nice bream of about six pounds in the net. So let's see what this cast brings and let's see if there is a shoal now moved in. Like I said, three or four more fish and you know, that's exactly what my target was. You know, three or four of those in the winter would be a nice, uh, a nice return. Fish number two, just switched to a window and started putting some worms in. Got that one bream, but it went very quiet. So I thought, you know what? Let's get some worms in and just try it. Now was the time to introduce them. Uh, I didn't chop them fine. I chopped them quite coarse and just put a few dead reds and just a few casters in with the worms. Very little ground bait. Uh, second cast on the window 
and then we've this has resulted in the second second bream of the day. Again, another nice fish. So I'll just keep the rod low until I get towards that near shelf. And as I get another few turns on the handle, then I'll just start gently lifting the fish towards me up and then over that near ledge. That's interesting switching to that window feeder, just with worms, very few casters, just a few dead reds as well, and then very, very little ground bait. Just get that fish over that ledge. Look at that lovely fish. Another fish about six pound, maybe near a seven. Again, hooked in the bottom lip, which is uh, tells me they're f f probably starting to feed now. Get a lovely fish, good six pounds, nice reward. Goes to show ringing the changes with those feeders does work and bait as well by putting some worms in. So yeah, another fish, number two. Let's try and get number three. Vital bit of kit for accuracy are these measuring sticks. I can measure out to 35 metres where I've actually found the right depth and the spot I'm going to fish today. I've done it with the bait up rod. Now what I want to do is I want to do exactly the same thing with the rods I'm going to fish with. So these are set at two and a half metres apart. So I'm going to pop the feeder over the first stick. Then I'm going to, two wraps on there is five metres. So I'm just going to count it round with you. So that's two and a half, that's five metres. Two and a half, ten metres. That's two and a half. Fifteen. That's twenty. Twenty-five. Thirty. And one more. So there, I'm going to measure that down. Pop the line around the line clip. And there you go, 35 metres. And that's exactly where I want to be fishing. So if I was to break off today, crack off, whatever, I can go straight back to the sticks, set up a rod and measure back to 35 metres. And I'm fishing exactly where I've been fishing all day and where the ground bait went initially. So definitely important for accuracy. Okay, I've just put some worms in again. Through, through, oh, there's another bite. Yep, that's on. Yep, another one. That's another one on the window. Ever since I've just started introducing worms. So it goes to show, even when you're pleasure fishing, don't get lazy. Don't sit there thinking you've got no fish in front of you. When all that it means is just changing the feed, the type of feeder you're using and the bait that you're putting in the feeder. In this case, I'm putting less ground bait in. Less ground bait, worms, and a few dead red maggots. Three dead reds still on the hook, but at least I've got the option now to put a worm on. Um, but that's, that's two fish in two casts, that's three bream in four casts. And the most important thing is, is patience. You know, you, when you feel you're doing it right, um, I didn't want to start casting all around the, around the lake. I've got an angler opposite as well, so I can't go too far. Um, so yeah, so this is good. This is good now. So you know, this could potentially be six, seven pounds. So you know, we're looking at three, three bream for nearly twenty pounds. So you know, you're not looking at lots of skimmers. You're not looking at lots of roach for a similar weight. Again, it's three bites. Three bites, nearly twenty pound. Again, just keep that rod high because of that ledge close in, and just let him pump on that tip. That's why it's important to have a rod with this action because. This is at the time where if you do nod them on that near side shelf, there's every chance of just pulling the hook out. There you go, you can see the window feeder now. See how big this one is? That looks even bigger. And there we go, fish number three, another big fish. Now that is a brute of a bream. Look at the size of that. That one, number three in the net, and that's three bites within the last 25 minutes since I've gone on a window feeder. 
That's three bream for 21 pound. So yeah, just goes to prove patience, confidence in what you're doing, keep fishing accurately, ring the changes with different feeder types, different ways of feeding, worms, less ground bait, sometimes more ground bait when the perch was there. I fed a little bit more, a few more maggots, a few more casters to try and fill them up. That worked, but unfortunately no bream came after. So I've switched to the window, mainly worms, a few dead reds, very little ground bait, three bites, 21 pound. Happy days. Just gonna go through the process of casting. Right, it's very important. The first thing is that you check behind you, check, especially with these, the level low, the trees and everything else, but I've sat in a position where I'm not gonna get caught with the bank behind me. Just a case of reel a feeder up for a drop of about a meter, four feet. Just check everything's, you know, you can feel it on your finger. Now, when you're casting, one of the important things is your left arm is as important as your lead arm, which is your right arm in my case, because I'm right-handed. So what I'm gonna do, you'll see, I'll notice I'm gonna lead with my right, but I'm gonna pull in with my left. And that flexes the blank, which is the bit that does the work. So I'm just gonna show you now. Line it straight, so line yourself up with your marker. Swing it back fully. Let it go, hit the clip, right on the money. Then I'm gonna bring the rod back around as if it's gonna go over the rest. I'm gonna wait for that feeder, which has now hit the bottom. Put the bail arm over and then just gather the slack, not the feeder, so I'm not gonna dislodge the feeder. I'm just gonna gather the slack straight onto the rest, and that hasn't moved. And now what I'm gonna do is slowly just gather that slack. A lot of times in these deep waters, you can get a bite almost instantly as that feeder hits the bottom, fish will come to it. And that last 70 centimeter drop on that, on the, hook lane, on the hook lane, which is about two and a half feet. Now I can watch that, now I've got a bend in the tip. So if I get a quick bite, I'm into it. If I've got that rod under the water, I can't see if I've had a bite and missed it, which then I'll be sat there with mush bait. So now I'm in a position to wait for a bite. So very simple, very straightforward, just keep it smooth and accurate. Just tucked into fish number four, turning out to be a fantastic, afternoon's fishing for you guys in front of the cameras. Okay, I'm expecting, in the hope, sorry, of catching maybe three, four fish. Um, it's taken a while, but like we said before, patience, just knowing you're doing the right things, just taking it easy, there's no rush, keeping things simple, and just thinking about what you're doing, thinking about what's going on underwater, and then trying a few things like not putting worms in at the start keeping that as my little gambit I suppose you could say right at the end you know just in the hope that I wasn't going to draw small fish that I was just going to draw some bream at the end if I couldn't catch on my sort of caster and maggot approach with fish meal ground bait slightly smaller fish probably about four or five pound but still number four in the net lovely Lovely, you can see that window feeder there, which is doing the damage now. Lovely fish, fish number four. Pristine condition. Let's get the hook out of him again. Bottom, bottom lip. Just can't believe how instant that window feeder has been. You know, once I caught that first fish on the cage feeder, and it's taken a couple of hours to catch that, apart from a few small fish. It was literally instant because I'd caught that first one on the cage, which is what I always think. Once you get the fish there with the cage, it's the attractor, then it is literally a case of the, the, the cage will attract the fish, the window will catch the fish. And the other thing I did was obviously put the worms in with the maggots. And I think that's been important because you know I've been catch, I've caught on maggots. I was confident with the maggots because it's hard. And it wasn't until I put the worms in I was thinking about putting a worm on. Because it was so instant with the maggots, it goes to show that that way of fishing has been better. It's been positive. Also could mean that they didn't want too much ground bait because I'd put a lot in at the start. So I've actually eased back on the ground bait, put more loose food feed in like worms, maggots, casters. And then obviously just took with three dead reds on the hook, which has been fantastic. For those size fish, three maggots sounds a big bait, but believe me, if you see the size of the mouths on these fish, it's not a big bait, but yeah, great. I'm just gonna go through the setup that I've been using today, and a trusty setup, very simple setup as well, and certainly one that's worked this afternoon. Um, I'm gonna start with the end and terminal tackle. So 
I've used a 70 centimetre hook length uh, of 014 mainline. Again, these are big fish. You don't in the winter. You don't need to go any lighter than that. You're pulling fish up to eight pound here. You know, across 40 metres. So you need something quite strong. I've then got a six inch boom of twizzled mono, and that's an eight pound shock leader. So that's twizzled to a loop, which attaches hook, the hook length to. And then I've got a line stop to the knot. And also what I've done, that's free running. So if I do break off, the fish isn't going to be towing this feeder around the lake. That'll just come away because that's just free running. Then I've got a two inch, sorry, hooks come off, two inch feeder link, which just keeps that feeder away from the boom. Like I said, it lays against it, but it's double the thickness, so it's not going to cause any line damage. Swivel, eight pound shock leader, which takes two turns around the reel um, to O10 braid, braided, a braided main line. And that just keeps everything accurate. I can read every liner, every bite, kind of magnifies with braid, especially in the winter, I think that's important. And that is the setup. And the feeder wise, that's a 30 gram with a headwind like I've had today. You need 30 gram to hit this, hit the line clip with ease. You don't want to be standing up whacking it, you know, with an 11 foot rod. You can just go up on the feeder and it's quite deep out there as well. And the good thing about a window feeder, it just take the bait straight down to the bottom. You don't get very little coming out. So you're not going to draw those bream up off the bottom. So yeah, so that's the setup, very simple. So that's fish number five. It's certainly been a late show today. Uh, and it's only half past one. It's not like it's late, late in a, on a winter's day. We've still got potentially three hours of light to go. But it's definitely just that switch, that change. Window feeder, worms. I know it sounds like a broken record here, but it's, uh, it's almost coming, it's become exciting at the very end. You know, I was almost worried that we weren't going to get a film out of it at one point, but I did have the confidence I was doing it right, just not sure the fish were on this side of the lake because we saw a few roll on the opposite bank today, but goes to show they've probably been there all day. Steep slope there, so just keep that rod high as you get close in. These are big fish, these aren't skimmers. That's another nice fish probably six seven pound I would have thought and again nice thing about fishing a shock lead you can just hear it you always know the fish is in the netting range as that not comes through the eyes a lovely fish probably nearer seven pound than six in the net fish number five to start the session off today what I've done is I've put in two and a half pints of ground bait, half a pint of dead maggots, casters, and a few grains of corn, as shown earlier in the session. Just gonna go through the different feeders I've used. I'll start with the bait up feeder, it's already attached to the rod. So I've got it on a simple boom attached to braid, and that's O12 braid, and that's the type of feeder I'm using as a bait up feeder. It's basically a large four square. The weight at the bottom, because I've had a headwind, so, that's the kind of feeder I use to fish up to feed up to 40 meters. If I was to go longer, I'd use this Guru bait up feeder, which is fantastic. It's like a large window feeder, fly like a rocket, and I can punch that out 60, 70 meters. And they're fantastic for distributing a lot of bait. And I can actually use that mid session if I want to say put four or five more big loads of bait in, if you like, especially with less ground bait and just same work I've done here today with worms few maggots, casters and so on. So they're both good, great different types of bait ups, but that's the one I've used predominantly today because of the distance I'm fishing and the depth of water I'm fishing in. Now I'm gonna just put that down and go through the types of feeders I've used today for the, for the session. Um, it's basically three types. There's the two, the, two, the two are really what we call cage feeders. One's a rocket type because the wind's one minute it's coming into our face that's a 30 gram rocket it's a Preston Innovations it's the hex mesh one so it's like a cage feeder but what's good it does keep the bait in very well because you can just trap it in with your thumb but it's very clever because the, the weights are angled like a triangle so the bait will actually fall free at the bottom so it empties out very well casts a dream I like the plastic as well because it comes up off the bottom quite quickly and doesn't snag so they're great I've used that and then this is the one I've used most to start with Again, cage feeders to kind of attract the fish, grip mesh, so I'm always happy that that sticky fish meal ground bait is going to hold there within, and then the, obviously the loose offerings in the middle. But once I caught my first fish on that, 
I then started putting a few worms in and switched to that and switched to the basically the feeder that's done the damage today and that's the window feeder that's a 30 gram Preston um, small window feeder and that's been fantastic and what I've done is I've plugged the worms a few just a few maggots and a few casters in minimal ground bait and again they fly like a rocket go straight down tighten up to it and that's all about to do is distributing my food right on the bottom where I'm fishing and that's been a really good feeder so that's caught me four of the five fish once I switched to it so they're the feeders I've used today you've cut back to me as I've just lifted into fish number six uh, again another big fish um, like I said the smallest fish I've got is probably six pound largest one's probably over eight pound so you can work out what sort of weight these are averaging number six if I get this in you're probably looking at 40 pound for six fish maybe a little bit more uh, feels like a big fish heavy fish but probably going to end the session on this one because they have come late but the changes have worked a dream and it's uh, nice to end on a high so yeah if it's been been great to go through this with you today and hope you've enjoyed the very first video we've done and maybe watch me get this in first feels like a good fish it does go for those near that near shelf they always go for that near shelf because they know there's snags there there's weed there there's rocks there now i can just see this you've probably just heard it come through but yeah it's another big fish Oh, that's a big fish. That is a big fish, that one. Yeah. Probably a good seven pound, that. So big, he just about fits in the landing there. Lovely fish, that. Again on the window feeder. Even the ducks like it. Look at that. Probably nearer eight than seven. So there we go, I'm going to end, up, end on a high, that's fish number six, that's the target, that's probably a good seven pound fish that, that was the target, I said it, come in here I'll be happy with six, aim for six, anyway I'm going to put this one back, so I hope you enjoyed that film, very first one I've done, and please like and, subscri like and subscribe to the page, to the, and uh, please make any comments you like in the comment box for any suggestions what you thought of this video and any venues you'd like me to try and give you my angle on it but uh, thanks for watching